I'm Lacey Bresky, and I'm joined by my friends and fellow international affairs colleagues, Drew. Hey. And Kevin. Hello. So today we're going to be discussing the Mexican cartels and some of their origins, trends, and future problems going forward, and most importantly, why it matters to all of us. So we have about five or six big cartel names that have dominated the news, but intercartel conflict and arrests of leaders has brought this topic right back into the news for us. So let's go back and start talking about background issues. What have you got for us, Drew? I, well, I think it's important to highlight that um, this issue is significant for a number of reasons. I'll hit on some, uh, and, then, and then Kevin can pick up maybe some of the ones that I leave out. But uh, one, this is, this is fundamentally an international issue, right? So for most of our discussion today, we'll probably be focusing on Mexico and the United States, right? But that's two countries and a border, and this is a contentious issue in both of those countries. It affects their relationships, uh, and it affects um, you know, other, other aspects, their relationship, and it affects other aspects of, of um, both government's policies. Um, obviously, um, we'll be talking a lot today about supply and demand. The supply in Mexico and other places facilitated through Mexico, and then mm-hmm. the demand is obviously in the United States. So that's that's a huge issue because this is a problem that's crossing national borders um, in a variety of, you know, many, many borders, not just the Mexico-U.S. border, but, but um, others as well. Sure. Yeah, and I think that's important when you talk about supply and demand. You know, if you ask why is this happening and where are they coming from? Uh, it's a basic economics. There's a, a demand in the United States and in, in Europe as well, of course, and throughout the world. But, I mean, the United States is the largest consumer of, of cocaine in the world by a long shot, but more than more than all of Western Europe combined. So where there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. So really, you've got you've got these cartels that are just filling an economic need or an econ- economic demand. I'll call it. So, so I'd say that that's really at the heart of the problem is the fact that you've got a country with a huge demand, and there's no it's no it's no coincidence that the largest supplier, or at least facilitator of of narcotics, is adjacent to the largest demand. Okay, so we kind of have a, a rough background of of why these exist, but what about the burgeoning problems that we're seeing now? So we've got. Cocaine consumption that has dramatically dropped in the United States, but we also have the rise of heroin and cheap prices with a lot of competition flowing into the United States. What is law enforcement doing? What do we see are the reactions by both Mexican and United States law enforcement, and how do we combat this problem? Well, before I talk about what we're doing, uh, I think it's important to to look at the way that uh, cartels are financing this. You know, they get... You mentioned that cocaine, uh, the demand of cocaine has dropped significantly in the United States over the last decade or so, uh, but it's also increased almost as much in Europe. And then heroin, of course, is also uh, on the rise, and methamphetamines are probably the future for, for cartels. So there, there's no shortage of, of demand coming from, from the United States and Europe. But as far as what the United States is doing, you know, we're building fences, for one thing. Um, you know, a lot of the borders actually fenced off with a physical barrier some of it's virtual most of it is uh, is being monitored by unmanned drones i guess drones are unmanned by definition right unmanned <laughs> aircraft what else are we doing well we're also um there's a number of other higher level more strategic uh level things happening as well so the merida initiative is is a partnership between the U.S. and Mexican governments, um, and uh, I forget when it was instituted. I believe 2008, which I, I think tries to hit at the problem in a number of ways. So, uh, in addition to beefing up border security um, and focusing on some of those more tactical issues, I think the U.S. government strategy with the Merida Initiative is to is to sort of hit at some of the environmental issues that are exacerbating or producing the problem. One of those is police training initiatives. So so uh, providing training and support uh, and governance uh, related support to the Mexican government and its law enforcement infrastructure as well as providing more more substantive things like you know drug sniffing dogs uh, and then money to to uh, provide supplies and, and and other infrastructural type things that are necessary to 
to help combat this problem on the Mexican side before it even comes up to to the border. Which I think is, I think, one of the smartest moves that the U.S. government has done so far in combating this problem, which is an excellent point, Drew. But again, how far can this really go when we have a corrupt government that we're dealing with? We've got multiple factions that are corrupt, not only at the high levels, but also in this within the states themselves, within Mexico. So what... How far can this go? I mean, sure. before that problem needs to be confronted. So corruption is obviously a, a huge issue, but I, I want to point out the corruption is not just on the Mexican side. It's on the American side and throughout the world as well. Um, but maybe it's a, it's a, a little bit more, to, to be fair, it's, it's a little bit more intense on the Mexican side. The drug czar of Mexico was, I think he was detained because it came out that he was accepting up to $450,000 a month on the Mexican payroll. It's quite a hefty salary. Yeah, I mean, uh, for $450,000 a month, I can't say that I wouldn't be tempted. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but, I mean, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I'm joking, by the way, if you're listening to this. Yeah, if you can I see his face. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on the American side, I mean, this has been a huge issue as well because you've got Border Patrol agents, uh, I mean, hundreds literally who have been arrested because they've accepted bribes and like a couple thousand dollars for letting truckloads of cocaine to pass through truckloads of cocaine for a couple thousand dollars i mean it's insane this is where like akil gets a hundred thousand dollars in the market so the corruption's on both sides of the border i think how do you deal with that it's i mean it's, it's really hard i think to to make any difference when you've got corrupt governments that you're dealing with or a corrupt government no, it's an incredibly difficult problem to confront, made more complicated. And I think that this is, you know, perfect segue to our, our next sort of topic is that it's made more complicated by the fact that cartels are now shifting structurally to match and mirror how law enforcement has gone after them. They're really changing their own structures in order to mimic a way of getting around law enforcement. And so it's always this cat and mouse game where the cartels are constantly morphing and one step ahead and law enforcement on both sides are playing catch up. So uh, in what ways have they, uh, have they changed? I, I can think of some, you know, some more tangible ways that they've changed, but have they changed like structurally. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that we're seeing within the cartels themselves, but also new factions that have split out, off the top of my head, I can say the Jalisco boys, as well as the Montezetas um, and other smaller fa splinter groups and factions that have gone off, I would say that the structure has less hierarchy than, previ than it previously had. Well, I was talking earlier with a friend today that about the fact that El Chapo Guzman, the former and continual head of the Sinaloa cartel, really st is one of the few now. There really aren't a lot of chief men and i hate to say it ladies but it is definitely just men in charge and what we're seeing now is a more horizontal and lateral spread where most of the factions are disseminating la less top down and more out wide and little factions are splintering off in various places to just it makes it easier to distribute it makes it easier to command these partitions to go out and um deliver products but it also makes them easier to get away with things and it makes it easier for law or harder for law enforcement to actually be able to go out and get them so what you're saying is that we need more gender equality in the drug cartel that's leadership. exactly what the moral of that is absolutely <laughs> that was uh, where i was headed i think also something that's really interesting i mean i didn't know that that's that's interesting but i'm also fascinated by you know you said as a cat and mouse game some of the ways that cartels have gotten around some of the technology that the U.S. government and the Mexican government have put in place to try to stop this. So, like, we talked about the multi-billion dollar fence that they're building, and cartels have gotten around that by using catapults to just launch drugs over <laughs> the fence, which couldn't cost more than, like, a couple hundred dollars, <laughs> right? Absurd. But, you know, it's, that's hard to, to stop that because it's, it's a long fence, right? And who would have thought? Yeah, right. who would have I mean, thought that, right? Exactly. I like mean, it's kind of like the, uh, the Maginot line, uh, <laughs> but for, for drug cartels. Um, also, uh, you know, they're building tunnels, which El Chapo is obviously very well known for. Uh, doesn't he have a, some sort he of... He did nickname? a great job, by the way. He does a great job I gotta job give it to tunnels. him. He does. He really has a knack Don't for it. Don't they call him, like, the mole or something like that? Uh, remind me. No. They probably do now. If they probably are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, they're digging tunnels, which are pretty high-tech tunnels, right, with electricity, 
air conditioning. Um, you know, I mean, n- not a bad way to travel. Better than Metro. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Wamada. <laughs> But something else that I found fascinating, and I didn't really even know this before I started doing the research recently, is that they're starting to, to avoid dealing with the hassle of transporting drugs across the border. They're apparently also growing in the United States, right? So uh, a few years back, they, they found a huge crop of marijuana in Wisconsin, in Northwoods, Wisconsin, you know, where nobody's going. It's just like a, an isolated forest with tons of marijuana being grown. So, and that, that really uh, cuts the corner of having to deal with the borders. Absolutely. It's brilliant on their part. And I think uh, that's another example of the fact that they are so able to manipulate themselves and change and morph to avoid law enforcement detection. And I think one of the other things is they're often growing their land, their crop. I mean, marijuana frequently in this case is on BLM land. Uh, a lot of times they will grow it on borderland management, federal land, and it goes undetected because frequently there are a lot of areas that can't be patrolled. And then you come up on a giant grow site and sure enough, the cartels have a hand in it. So I think once one of that, that is one of the biggest things I've seen so far. So do we have any other anomalies in within that structural system that we should look at? Well, I want to point to more, uh, again, I want to point to more of the shape of the structural system. So a lot of these cartels, not only are they dealing with competition of a kind with the government, right? So competition for monopoly on violence in in specific territories, uh, not only with, with the U.S. government, but then also with, with the Mexican government does, does put up quite a fight. Uh, but they're also competing with each other. That's something that we haven't been talking about as much, I don't think. That that they do they do fight with each other and they do compete for territory and I, I'm not sure how to what extent the U S and Mexican governments are building this into their strategies the fact that these organizations are not all working together against any one government but they also control right turf yeah this is not the the Mexican or U S government versus one entity it's not just a a, a monolithic insurgency right which I think is interesting because you think about it the word cartel it's really a misnomer. This is not a cartel. These aren't cartels. These are, these are organizations working not with each other, but against each other. If it were a cartel, if it really was a cartel, it would be a lot less violent probably. Right. But they, but what's interesting though, is that they do form alliances and I get a shout out to, you know, to get my, uh, my uh, international affairs, uh, one one credit, uh, for using it outside of class. Um, <laughs> the, the the structures that these organizations use to form alliances with each other and then break those alliances and then enter into competition is relatively reminiscent of the international system in general, where states at the country level operate anarchically. Right? They they will form alliances for their benefit as long as it benefits them. And then they'll turn on those alliances exactly. the second it stops benefiting them. It's the nature of economics. Is the nature of the international system generally? That's Which, interesting. And this is an economic game. I mean, this is about money. These are businesses. This is absolutely yeah. business. Yeah, I mean, if uh, if chocolate were more lucrative than cocaine, then that's probably what they would be dealing in, right? Yeah, they have no... Uh, I think most women would be uh, on board with that, though. Chocolate? Oh, absolutely. I would be, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'd be... To a point. I'd be all over... That's sexist. Debate. I'd be all over the chocolate. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Unless it were legal, then I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> you can Thank see you for face. clarifying. So going forward... Well, we've seen some of these trends and we've already hit on a few of them, but I think one of the other big trends to talk about is that the face of drugs is shifting. I mean, we're no longer just focused on the consumption of cocaine and the traditional, I want to say traditional and not that old, but heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, but we've also got bath salts. Uh, A lot of things that are coming up now are hallucinogens and big time addictions that are growing out of former methamphetamines. I mean, a lot of these share chemical properties, but bath salts have also made it into the news quite frequently. I mean, I think everybody heard about the story in Florida where the guy ate off somebody else's face. Yeah, it seems like that was happening like on a weekly basis for a while. It was. It was very, very, and it's still continuing to be trendy. And I think the bigger thing that we're looking at is also just the price thing. And when when we were in an economic recession and slump, People didn't want to fork out a lot of money for drugs, uh, apart from addicts and ha- and people who had formed you know significant habits. But the price of heroin is significantly cheaper, which I think accounts for 
a large portion of why people are going after that. Yeah, that could be. I was I was kind of hoping that uh, U.S. government was just doing a good job of, uh, you know, cocaine prevention, but maybe not. I think heroin also is a lot easier to get across the border. So her- heroin is cheaper than cocaine. Yes. So I don't know my drugs very it well. Vest- very much is. Got to okay. tell you. I know. Also, last time I was out on the street. I know cocaine is. Uh, <laughs> I'm is just a, kidding. Is a very like a, it's a lucrative uh, drug to transport because it's very high value per pound. Very right? much so. Uh, compared to marijuana, I guess, which is not as valuable per pound. And also it smells, so it's harder to, to hide and things like that. Uh, but yeah, actually, I didn't know about the heroin trend. Definitely. Definitely. So perhaps one of the other questions I have going forward is about the future for how do we battle this? How do we continue to look at this going forward? You kind of already hit on the wall aspect, but what about actual you know, therapy, addiction issues, other potential options for battling this. If we just break this down into two places that we have to target strategies at, one is Mexico, one is the United States. And there are policies that the United States can enact and has been enacting to a certain degree, like reassessment of what kinds of drugs need to be illegal, right? And what kinds of drugs can be can be legal but controlled so that the government has more information to attack and, and, and act on these issues, violent sources of drugs, right? That's that's one side of it. The other side would be, you know, what can the U.S. government do to help the situation in Mexico, the structural and environmental uh, situation that is exacerbating this problem and, 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 and producing it? And that would be, you know, focusing more on the supply side rather than the demand side, which would be, you know, more difficult. But frankly, one of the major issues here is, is corruption. The government in New Mexico is strong enough to maintain some degree of territorial integrity to allow it to be lucrative uh, and allow an environment in which these uh, these groups could make money and and actually, you know, build their business without everything just breaking down, but not strong enough to rest back territory, rest back people, compete with these organizations for uh, for supremacy in, in particular parts of their territory. And that is the fundamental problem. So strategies I mean, need to be, you know, hitting that. Sure. I mean, I agree with that. But I wonder if uh, corruption is not a given when you've got an economy that demands, you know, the kind of illicit activity that is, is so lucrative, right? So I feel, I feel like if there's enough demand that's giving... That that's this financially lucrative for cartels or for whatever drug trade organizations or agencies, that's that's enough money to corrupt any government. You know, uh, I mean, there are government officials in any country that can be corrupted by that kind of money. So I, I don't know. I feel like it's maybe kind of a given. I, I feel like personally, the demand side is what you really need to focus on. Investing money, you know, we've invested billions of dollars in defenses. Maybe it might be more practical to invest more money into drug prevention and recovery having said that i don't know even if you get people off of addiction cartels and and you know drug runners are going to do what they can to addict people there are examples of drug cartels in mexico shipping over methamphetamines for free uh because they know that it would addict cities or or it would addict that markets would become addicted and that it would uh it would create markets for them yeah yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, from from a U.S. perspective, probably the most effective strategy, the most effective solution would include working on on that demand side rather than the supply side, because there's only so much that you know we can do or want to do in Mexico. But there, I think there are more clever ways of going about removing or reducing significantly the the demand for this problem. Okay, so I think we agree with that, but. Trump said Mexico is going to build a wall and they're going to pay for it. So uh, what do you think? Is that is that likely? And if so, would it even be helpful? No. <laughs> I mean, I think he says things. He says, all, Trump he says, says a lot things, of stuff. period. Like he, he really just, does. Yeah, he says a lot of stuff and, and it's not entirely consistent. But you got to love him, right? But what are, you know, but why would they pay for that? Why do they want? Why do they want anything to do with that? I don't think large sections of the Mexican government, and I'm no expert on Mexican politics, history, governance, anything, but I, 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 clearly there is not going to be enough momentum within the Mexican government to say, 
yes, build a wall on our northern border to stop all this stuff from happening because some of them benefit from it. And again, corruption, this feeds some of their families, right? And right, they take cuts, right? This has been the case for 70 years in Mexico, for 70 years. Right, the PRI party they ruled Mexico for a large uh, for 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 seven decades, and they allowed this to go on in certain areas. They allowed these control what they I guess what they thought were controlled wildfires. But I mean, that it, a business is going to continue to try to grow, and this is a business that they allowed to happen, uh, and they benefit from it. They benefited from it, and so they. Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be enough cooperation from the Mexican side to do something like build a wall, like Donald Trump says, or or stop any of this from happening just because we say it's harming us, right? One thing I think we haven't touched on yet, but I, th- I think is important to ensure that we sort of have a well-rounded discussion about this topic, is human smuggling. So I... Th- a lot of cartels are investing time in this because it's lucrative. And again, like we already discussed, this right, is all about the money. It's more about the money than anything else. So, Kev, what do you have for us on this? Well, I, I think there's an interesting trend. Um, it's been happening in the last maybe five to ten years. Uh, you know, like you like you mentioned, cartels are in it for the money. So, there's been a lot of uh, violence, particularly in, in El Salvador, Guatemala. Honduras, and this is this has caused a lot of people, kind of like what we talked in our last episode, uh, a brain drain from these countries. People who want to go to the United States to seek better opportunities, uh, and these cartels have swept in sw- uh, because they've already got the networks, right? They've got the tunnels, they've got the uh, they've got control of the roads. Um, in some cases, they've built their own roads and their own bridges, so they're taking advantage of this, shipping people over and. The, the benefit is, you know, these people are willing to pay. And a lot of times they're willing to pay because of the violence that's often insinuated by the cartels themselves. And in the end, what happens if they get caught, they just get sent back and then have to pay again, right? So if you're shipping drugs and that gets caught, then you're, you've, you've lost your profit. Exactly. There's not, a, there's not a big loss for these people on both sides if it doesn't work out. Right, I mean it's it's harsh, but this is this is a product for them, and it's it's something that's actually in their best interest if they don't get to cross. Yeah, and I think we're seeing this specifically though in Central American countries like Guatemala, like El Salvador, like Honduras, where we have places that are very impoverished but also incredibly violent right now um, with their own internal strife and gangs, and people just went out. Yeah, actually, there uh, there are cases where these cartels are going even door to door. I mean, you know, it's not like El Chapo is going door to door, but their minions nice um, are are going door to door and encouraging people to leave and and you know advertising that we can take you across the border on these awful awful trips. And in many cases, people die because for them it's a product. And there have been cases where they they leave them in trucks, you know, for a month at a time, and they all die. Some of them do cross, and that's why a few months back we saw this huge influx of people coming from from Central America. I don't remember how many tens of thousands of, of children, unaccompanied children, crossing the border. And this is in large part facilitated by coyotes and and you know minions of drug cartels. I had not known that. I guess I'd never put together those two trends: illegal immigration, which obviously has elements of human smuggling in it, but then facilitation by drug cartels who already have the networks. Exactly, they have, yeah. They have, again, I know I use this word too much, but monopoly on violence over the routes, right? And they, they, you know, they know how to get into the country illegally already because they're already, they've been doing it for years and you can, this is just another, it's natural, this is a business. Uh, it's a business, exactly. It's a lot of people product. have compared it not to, you know, uh, a service that's, that's or not, not to a company that's providing a service or a product, but basically like a, like a shipping service, you know, like a FedEx. Honestly, a lot, like a lot of experts have compared this to a FedEx where they're in the business of shipping. I hope not USPS. FedEx just has a few more perks. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, I mean, so a lot of, a lot of uh, experts have compared this to uh, a FedEx type service. They've got the networks. They ship products or sometimes people cross the border. Another great, another opportunity that they're seizing here is the fact that 
they can send these people over the border with drugs in tow, right? Yeah, they can kill two birds with one stone. Right. And these are mules, not voluntary mules. These are people who are just trying to get across the border, trying to survive. So, I mean, that's that makes it doubly awful. So on that positive note, Grace Chesson, what do you have for us on the bright side? All right. So from this conversation, we obviously get that Mexican drug cartels are bad. But I want to look at a couple of trends here that aren't quite as disheartening. So first, just looking at some stats here. So in the first six months of 2015, the quantity of cocaine that was confiscated by Mexico's army was 2,800 kilos, or roughly 2,800 kilos. And that represents more than a 340% increase from how much was seized um, during the same period in 2014. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's a big change. Right. And so, you know, obviously there are some caveats with this, you know, can we attribute that all to the Mexican army's productivity or i mean are there other issues that may have played a role in that change i mean yeah Lacey, there are always a a number of issues that kind of contribute to these numbers but you know overall i think this does this does show a positive trend you know there are increases in the training and the capacity of the army and police forces and this moves into another piece of that has been a number of reforms so specifically in the judicial space and so this is you know not necessarily looking you know at the at the arrest and at the violence but it is looking at the nation's infrastructure and its ability to deal with the cartels so there are a number of judicial reforms that have been coming from um, the mexican government and this is looking at training of the justice sector personnel, so including police, prosecutors, et cetera. Um, And this also, I think my last part, which it ties into, is the bilateral relations with the U.S. and Mexico. So the U.S. has been a partner in supporting these judicial reforms. And that's one piece, I think Drew mentioned this earlier, of the Merida Initiative. And so this was an initiative um, between the U.S. government and the Mexican government And since 2008, I think $2.3 billion has been appropriated by Congress. So we see... um, So U.S. is still funneling money to really combat this problem from both angles, not just the U.S. side. Definitely. And, you know, as we've seen this problem grow and the violence continue, it really has facilitated a stronger bilateral coordination, cooperation, um, and support between the two governments. Great. Well, thank you, Grace, for giving us at least something uplifting about this (laughs) rather dreary topic, per usual. Join us next time at mattersofstate.org. Like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash mattersofstate. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, live there.